All right. Okay, let me uh, share my screen. All righty. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Hope you all had a great uh, Thanksgiving. Sorry to those who are on call. Welcome, Ms. Mel Holtra, medical student, joining us this week. <clears throat> All right. Um, so let's go through to our first, first tracing today. Okay. Um, so this is a tracing that was obtained following uh, tetralogy repair. This is an early postoperative electrocardiogram. And um, the uh, fellow sent me this tracing. Uh, you know, this was like a post-op. I was on call one evening, and uh, this was the tracing that was obtained a couple, you know, once the patient was settled in bed, et cetera, and uh, just wanted to clear it with me. And the fellow uh, wrote the following. Post-op ECG, sinus rhythm, I think with new incomplete right bundle branch block, confirmed QTC was 482. And she, what she uh, she was referring to is the QTC that the computer had calculated for this tracing. So I guess my question to you is, uh, do you agree with this uh, analysis? And I'm going to ask, uh, when I ask uh, Tarek Zawani, Super fellow, what do you think? Morning, Dr. Pass. Um, Good morning. Yeah. Um, so I, um, we have, um, I think I agree with the sinus rhythm because I see the uh, B wave be, um, um, upright in one, two, and AVF and before each QRS. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, right bundle branch block. Um, they can can clearly see it in the uh, lead one ABR and also in V1. But I think for the QTC, I think it's going to be hard to assess. I think for two reasons. Uh, the first one is because of the right bundle. And the second reason, like we always see QTC like um, somewhat prolonged after the after a surgery. Um, so well, why do we see a QT prolonged after surgery? This is not a concept I'm as familiar with. So um, tell me what you what you're, you're applying. Um, so I mean, there can be like yeah. uh, electrolyte abnormalities and things after a run of bypass. That's certainly possible. Yeah, I think the I think your first point though about the the uh, bundle branch is important. And that's really mm -hmm. the main reason I wanted to, I wasn't hundred percent sure I understood why the fellow was, um, shall we say, confirming the QT was prolonged. When mm -hmm. somebody has a wide QRS, right? They're going to, uh, because the QT interval includes the QRS duration, as well as the uh, QT interval, uh, the, you know, the ST interval, it's not surprising that someone with a bundle branch block will have a prolongation in their QT interval. So the fact that the QT is 480, although that would normally be very worrisome in anybody uh, who is otherwise has a structurally normal heart and somebody who has a bundle branch block, I don't actually think it's germane or matters very much. I mean, uh, so I'm just making this point that uh, although the uh, fellow was 100% accurate, this is, a, this is true, that the QT is is somewhat prolonged. It doesn't really have any practical. It doesn't really matter because the QRS duration is prolonged. Now, yes, if the QT was you know five hundred, you know you're a so that's why sometimes people will measure a so-called JT um, point interval, which is you know from the end of the QRS interval to the end of the T wave, and sort of use that as a surrogate of a QT interval. In which case, I think we would agree that this would probably come out in the normal range. So um, anyway, I'm just making that point. Thought it was an interesting one that the fellow made to me. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next. Uh... Somebody have a question? I'm sorry. No? Okay. 
So, <clears throat> excuse me. This is a 14-year-old child uh, who is referred for an irregular heartbeat uh, auscultated on physical examination. So my questions to you are, what are we seeing and uh, how would you evaluate this patient? Um, so why don't I uh, toss this over to Dr. Condon? Good morning. Good morning. So I'm um, I'm seeing um, there is a P wave in one that looks upright um, in two. Um, see, I can't really tell if there's a P wave that's down turning or if uh, if there's an up upright one with like a really short PR interval in two. Um, and same with well, AVF. Do P waves, I mean, how long does it take the uh, the sinus? I mean, when you, from the time the sinus node fires till the time that we see a QRS, what's like the the shortest period of time that could be? Like what's a normal PR interval? Um, about 80. Okay, milliseconds. that's right. Uh, that's about the minimum. Um, so the only way you could see that if you were in sinus rhythm, right, would be if you were pre-excited. Mm -hmm. So are you pre-excited in this tracing? It doesn't look like it. No, it's not. So yeah. so this okay. is this is the P wave. The gotcha. This right. I mean, this is much mm -hmm. more normal. You know, right? You're you're saying mm -hmm. you were trying to say, is it possible that this mm -hmm. little bump here, right, is a mm -hmm. P wave? But really. It's this, right? Because physiologically, it's impossible for there to be a P wave that's conducting that rapidly to the ventricle, unless, of sure. course, uh, there were pre-excitation, which I think we agree there are not. We see nice little, little Q waves in the lateral precordial leads. So this would argue against that. Um, sure. Okay. So now so, we know where the P wave is, so I'll let mm -hmm. you continue the analysis. First of all, do you agree that this is an irregular heartbeat? Yes. Yeah, I agree as well. Okay, mm -hmm. so now, now why don't you continue your analysis? Sure. So it does not look like, uh, I mean, you kind of already said this, but it does not look like sinus rhythm. Um, but if we're going in- Well, not entirely. It's not sinus rhythm. I not agree. entirely. Sure. So so in two, three and F, mm -hmm. right, most of the P waves are inverted, right? Yes. All right. We agree now that this is the P wave. Okay, mm -hmm. because it has to take a certain period of time. Now, interestingly, if your P wave is originating low in the right atrium, then the PR interval can actually be shorter, right? Because the the time it takes for mm -hmm. conduction from a, a site that's close to the AV node to conduct through the node and then depolarize the ventricle is obviously going to be shorter just because mm -hmm. you don't have to travail the entire length of the atrium. But mm -hmm. if the P waves are inverted, in the inferior lead, you, certainly the PR interval looks in the normal range. Um, but are all the P waves inverted? Why don't you look at this um, sure. script here? I think it's uh, useful. Yes. So in the first two beats, no, they're in, uh, I mean, yes, they are inverted. Uh -huh. um, and then there's a long um, interval before the next uh, QRS complex. And the P wave in the third beat looks upright. Mm -hmm. Um, then down, down, and then a long pause, up, down, down, up, up, down, 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 down. So, right. so um, what do you think the, the upright P waves likely represent what? Sinus. Right, right, correct. Mm -hmm. And the, so what would we call, uh, what, what would we call this other uh, focus? Mm -hmm. An ectopic atrial focus. Yeah, so this patient is basically having some combination of sinus rhythm and an ectopic atrial rhythm, right? Yeah. So if you're seeing this EKG, someone is referred to your office for an irregular heartbeat and you see this electrocardiogram, mm -hmm. um, what are your concerns about this patient? First of all, what would you ask the patient? Are you having symptoms? Or are you feeling... Right. Um... So that would be very important, right? Because... If the patient is asymptomatic, your level of urgency in evaluating and fixing this is a lot lower, right? So in right. most cases, and in the case of this patient, the patient was uh, asymptomatic, did not have any symptoms, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, anything else you want to know about the patient or anything really? 
Um, I would obviously want to know if they have a cardiac history, um, if they've had uh, any nope. surgery. No. no cardiac history. And, oh. uh, <laughs> this tracing suggests also that there has not been surgery, or at least not a significant one. I mean, you could have a PDA or a co-arct, I guess, with this, but... Uh, Mm -hmm. um so oh. uh so now the patient has this and you're hearing this on auscultation as well so right. what would be you're in the office with the patient what kind of testing would you uh consider doing on this patient um ultimately i would get um a zeo or a holter right. monitor and, and why do you want to do that i agree with you to see uh, on a larger uh, scale, like what percentage of their heart uh, rhythm is ectopic or abnormal, um, or if they have other arrhythmia. And why does that matter? Um, how much of it, how much they're in it? Um, I agree with you. It is an important yeah. question. Well, uh, I know that if you have, say, for example, like ectopic atrial tachycardia, which I mean, it doesn't look like here, but say they're, uh, they're, they're in tachycardia for a long period of time, they run the risk of being, of it degenerating into a ventricular arrhythmia. Well, um, it's not so much that you would degenerate into a ventricular arrhythmia. What happens? What's the biggest concern we have in people who have ectopic atrial tachycardia? What, what can happen to their heart? If they're stuck in EAT all the oh, time. Oh, sorry. So like a fu function problem. Right. They can develop mm -hmm. very severe tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. So, okay. okay. So I agree. You would definitely want to get a Holter mm -hmm. or a Zio to confirm uh, how much of the day they're spending in this uh, abnormal heart rhythm. Uh, mm -hmm. Any other testing you might want to do based on what we've just discussed? Mm -hmm. I would want to get an echo. Right. You'd want to get an echo. And on the echo, you're looking obviously at the systolic function. You're also looking to see if there's any dilation of the heart because sitting in an ectopic atrial rhythm a lot of the time at an elevated uh, heart rate would be concerning. What would you be looking for on the ZO? So you get your ZO back and uh, you know, what would what would be the things you would be interested to know if you like if you could stand in front of the patient the day you met them and you knew the results, what would you want to know um, in terms of coming up with a plan? Do you mean like uh, whether triggered events correlate with um, what's showing up on the ZEO reading? Well, a triggered event, of course, is a patient's symptom. That's what mm -hmm. that's what ZEO calls a symptomatic event. Um, okay. But this patient is asymptomatic. So one of the first things we'd want to know, of course, is what's the average heart rate, right? Because mm -hmm. we've explained that the faster the heart is beating in this abnormal rhythm, uh, the more likely you're going to develop dysfunction. And... Um, so one of the important questions is, you know, like what's the average heart rate of this patient and how does that compare to a normal average heart rate? And uh, so that would be one important question. And the next important question would be what percentage of the beats are sinus beats versus these ectopic atrial beats? And um, oftentimes you'll see on the Zeos, because I read all of them, uh, mm -hmm. the computer will calculate, you know, there are you know, 72,000, uh, you know, isolated premature atrial beats or whatever. And, um, and then that'll, they'll give us a percentage of the total number of beats. And generally speaking, um, you know, under 30%, it's unlikely that you're going to see a significant uh, effect on ventricular function. Um, so, uh, you know, and the other question is what happens when the person exercises? Does the sinus rate accelerate and um, temporarily extinguish this, right? Remember the rule of the heart, which is whatever is fastest wins. And so on this tracing, when the patient was at rest, presumably the ectopic atrial focus was uh, beating at a rate that is um, 
faster than the intrinsic rate and so sinus rate. And so the patient is basically mostly in ectopic atrial rhythm with some sinus poking in there. Um, but uh, the question is, um, you know, if the patient exercises, does the sinus rate kick up and then suppress the ectopic atrial tachycardia? That would generally be a more reassuring sign in somebody uh, who has some kind of EAT. Um, you know, so, and I think we could also say based on the morphology that this is coming from somewhere in the inferior atrium because it's uh, move, go, the P wave is inverted in the inferior lead. So moving away from that area. So this would probably be relatively straightforward to ablate if one wanted to, but really one would only ablate a patient like this if they uh, either were symptomatic or had dysfunction. Otherwise, we might not even treat this at all in an asymptomatic patient other than to monitor it. So any any questions on that? Interesting, interesting observation. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right. So uh, this is a uh, old school download. Uh, so in the old days, just for historical uh, purposes, we used to have companies like this company, MedNet, um, and essentially, you know, today we have patients who have are they're you know like if you have a Medtronic pacemaker or a Boston Scientific pacemaker, uh, they are Bluetooth enabled to devices that uh, the company gives to the patient on the day of pay, the pacemaker surgery, and typically uh, they plug the device into the outlet in their bedroom, and uh, every evening uh, the device communicates with it. And then uh, quarterly, uh, Josie, our nurse practitioner, will program the device to do a full 100% review of all of the factors of the pacemaker. And it's really remarkable. It's the amount of data that comes out of these tracings. And there's a whole literature on this, and it's developing over time. But in the old days, uh, they didn't offer that technology. And so basically, what would happen is patients would do these downloads and essentially, we would have these companies like MedNet, which I think still exists. And uh, basically, uh, the patient would have an EKG set up with some wrist and ankle bracelets and a little piece of equipment that would attach to a telephone. And there would, you would make an appointment with the representative of the company for a pacemaker check. And they would try their best to do it at a time that was... Uh, you know, proper for the patient, and that oftentimes it would be done at night. And um, essentially, what these these would do is, um, you know, measure that there was proper capture and that the battery was okay. That's really all it could do. Um, that we could not see the memory of the device. We could not measure the impedance to pacing, um, to measure lead integrity. We only really could check a threshold, a very very basic threshold and the battery. And so uh, basically um, the first thing that they would do is what they would refer to as presenting mode. And this is important to look at anyway, because there are some patients who have devices that don't actually have their own monitoring system. And so these companies still do exist. So the presenting mode was just basically EKG rhythm strip. And we see here that uh, the patient is basically pacing, um, you know, normally, uh, you know, somewhere in the 65, 70, it's in the 70, 65 range, uh, pay actually exactly at 65 beats per minute. And, um, and then what they would do is they would ask the patient to place a magnet on top of the pacemaker. So in addition to this EKG hookup, and this little communicator that the company would give to the patient, they would also give them a, a pretty strong magnet. And so at one point, the uh, technologist will say, okay, please place the magnet on the pacemaker. And so what it would do is it would pace, uh, it depend, actually it would depend on the particular model what, what the pacemaker would do in, re in response to the magnet. In this case, um, basically, what it does is uh, it paces for three beats at a certain rate and then goes back into normal mode. <clears throat> and on the third paced cycle, the device will lower the uh, output of the pacemaker by 50% for one beat. 
And uh, the purpose of this was to do a threshold test. So this beat here actually was paced at one half of the amplitude of the first two beats. And this was sort of a poor man's way of knowing that you had programmed the device at twice the threshold uh, that the patient, at least twice the threshold of the patient. So as you could see, is a fairly good way to know that at least the basic features of the device were working. The other thing is that the rate that the pacemaker play, paces when a magnet is applied is also an important piece of information because, um, and also the rate that it, it paces when it reaches the elective replacement interval is important. And so you'd have to tell the company what the particular brand and model of pacemaker it was. And then they had this catalog where they knew that for this particular model, which was an ADSR01 Medtronic device, the beginning of life for BOL was 85 and uh, end of life was 65. This is the rate when a magnet would be applied. And so we see that when the magnet is applied, first of all, we see the patient presents at 65. Now, I may have programmed this patient at 65. Actually, I did not, though. You see here that the, the actual program was 70, VVIR at 70, but the patient is pacing at 65. So immediately, you know that the patient has gone to uh, ERI. But the other way you know it is by, I could have programmed them at 65, in which case you wouldn't have known. But as soon as the magnet is applied, we see that the pacing rate is at 65 as well. And so basically, uh, once we see the magnet rate at 65, we know that the patient is in um, uh, is at the ERI, and that would be the way we would know that the patient was time to do a pacemaker generator change. Now, we would not know when this happened, um, which you can tell on present day uh, you know, modern technology, but at least you would know to call the patient and say, okay, it looks like it's time to uh, do a pacemaker generator replacement. Um, and occasionally on the presenting electrogram, you would see problems with sensing that could also be uh, identified uh, in this manner. But I thought this was a nice tracing. And you would have to know, the company would have to know what the beginning of life and the end of life magnet rates were and every device, unfortunately, was different. I used to have this little thing they called it like uh, an encyclopedia of pacemakers. One of the companies would make it, and it was a spiral-bound notebook that had every single model ever made and what what it's supposed to do in reference to uh, end of life as well as um, placement of a magnet on the device. Um, and so that's how we would uh, check pacemakers in, in the old days. And to this day, now, when you place a magnet on a pacemaker, in almost every case, it causes the pacemaker to pace uh, asynchronously in a uh, either a DOO or a VOO manner. And uh, so sometimes when patients are undergoing uh, surgery, some anesthesiologists will place a magnet on the pacemaker in order that the electrocautery does not cause artifact that results in um, oversensing of it and lack of pacing. Um, the downside of it is because it's an asynchronous mode, in theory, if the patient were to have PVC, you could have an R on T phenomenon and induce VF. So we generally would prefer not to leave somebody in an asynchronous pacing mode, but if it's for just a few seconds or a few minutes uh, and under close observation, it's probably okay to do that. Um, now, importantly, when you place a magnet on top of a defibrillator, it will typically, in most, most defibrillators, it will deactivate the defibrillation of the device. Um, that's very, very important, obviously. Um, it's a, one of the reasons they do that is so that, for example, if you're coming into an emergency room, and you're receiving inappropriate shocks because the device is maybe has a broken lead, for example, the ER does not need a programmer in order to deactivate the defibrillator feature. They can just simply place a magnet over the device. And most emergency rooms do have a magnet somewhere for this purpose. Um, sometimes patients have asked if they could have a magnet who have defibrillators. I'm always a little wary of that though, because I would rather trust the defibrillator, even though the defibrillator could could be inappropriately shocking a patient. As a general rule, we would um, we would want to um, uh, not have a patient you know, deactivate their own defibrillator. Okay, 
So I thought this was just an interesting uh, historical uh, tracing. I'm gonna go ahead here, hold on. Okay, so this is a patient who has a two to one heart block. And the question is, is this Mobitz one? Is it Mobitz two? Or can you not tell? And I am going to ask, uh, I'm gonna ask Dr. Bebia if you can figure this out. Good morning. Good morning. So on this short tracing that we see. Mm -hmm. And uh, just so we see it's three EKG leads and then a His bundle electrogram uh, tracing. So. <clears throat> which has been nicely. That's very by, helpful. By yes. a kind, <laughs> kind electrophysiologist. Um, so we basically see an A, H, and V. Mm -hmm. A, H, and then A, H, and V. So I would say that this is Mobitz 2. That's uh, exactly correct. Cause Why? Because we, we don't see a V after an H. Uh, and as we know, uh, the Mobitz 2 is the block at the level of the His, not the AV node. Well, at the His Purkinje system. So, right. So... That's right. So uh, the AH interval typically uh, represents uh, the uh, conduction through the AV node. Remember, again, that we can't actually, through intracardiac tracings, record directly from the AV node. So we record the low right atrium and the uh, HIS and uh, infer the conduction through the AV node by the interval between the A and the H. And uh, what is a normal AH and a normal HV interval, Sir K? And are they normal in this tracing? Um, so I would say that um, AH um, would be, oops, tumble with that one. Um, is it um, about 120 or well, so? Well, that would be in the normal range for sure. But uh, what, so basically like, 70 to 150 is probably a normal AH interval. Uh, think of it similar to a, a PR interval. And what about um, an HV interval? What's what's the up, what are the normal range for an HV interval? HV would be around uh, 35 to 50, probably. That's exactly right. So, so what do you make of this HV interval? It's prolonged. Right, it's prolonged. Um, and so it isn't surprising that someone who on conducted beats has an HV of 80 will sometimes not conduct at all. Um, so this is an example of two to one heart block. So remember, we always talk about how you can't really tell when somebody has two to one heart block on a surface electrocardiogram. It's challenging to know if it's Mobitz one or Mobitz two. But in this particular case, we have an intracardiac tracing and uh, we can see that the level of block is at the infrahissian uh, level. So when somebody has open heart surgery, Sergey, and they are in two to one heart block, would this be the more common finding if we did an EP study on these patients or would it be more common to see block at the AV node lay level with uh, an A and no H, for example? Hmm. Um, after cardiac surgery. Mm -hmm. um, What's the more likely or most common place that surgeons inadvertently botch the uh, AV node? Yeah, I guess it would be, it probably would be Mobitz 1. So the AH? Actually, it's, actually it's Mobitz 2. It's usually at the infrahissian level, right? Which kind of makes sense, right? Because why do most of the time do they get heart block? What's the most common sort of surgical intervention where surgeons can sometimes get heart block? Well, just because they are, you know, cutting through myocardium. And they right, but where, where, where particularly are they? What's like the most common, like if you were going to look at a bunch of common surgical repairs, which would you think would have a fairly high incidence of heart block? The ones that are near the AV node, basically. So right. atrial atomy, and then if they 
Work well, atriotomy, well. atriotomy wouldn't normally, right? Because that's pretty usually atrium. Most surgeons enter the atrium lateral, superior lateral. So wouldn't normally, could injure the uh, sinus node around there, but not likely to injure the AV node. Um, but the next sorry. guess would be ven ventriculotomy. <laughs> well, a ventriculotomy, but what I'm, I'm trying to get at, I'm sorry, I hate when I, I play this game, you know, guess what I'm thinking. Um, VSD closure is what I'm looking for. So VSD closure right, uh, is always a very common area where you can you can get heart block. A uh, surgeon can inadvertently put a suture or two in the area. And obviously the VSD is going to be closer to the Hisprokinji system than to the AV node. You can rarely see a heart block after ASD closure. You don't like to see that. You'd like to imagine the surgeon can avoid that. But very rarely we do see that. And um, actually, one of the most common lesions you get heart block, but we don't see it here because Peter and Raghav are so good at it, is uh, in AV canal repairs. Uh, you can, uh, it's not uncommon to have heart block because of the unusual course of the uh, AV conduction system in patients who have a complete AV canal and just sort of, I mean, most of the time surgeons do not get that type of heart block because they are aware of the. Uh, of the course of the AV node during surgery. But, um, you know, and as you know, there are groups like in Boston now, they're going to the operating room and literally mapping the conduction on every single case of an intracardiac repair in order that the surgeon not put sutures um, in the area of the AV node and hispericinji. And they've demonstrated a reduction in in heart block um, in patients in whom that's done. The problem is it's a time consuming process. It requires another human being to be in the operating room. It requires electrophysiologic recording equipment as well as um, catheters, which need to be, um, which are disposable and are very expensive. So I think that um, um, what I'm hopeful is that over time, they'll be able to sort of come up with rules for different, um, different anatomies that maybe will make it less important to directly measure it in the operating room, but there'll always be uh, potentially an indication for mapping during surgery. Um, and we even had a patient here at Mount Sinai who went to Boston because they had heard they were doing this and they didn't want to risk the fact of getting heart block. That was their rationale for not having surgery at our hospital because we don't offer this. Actually, to my knowledge, nobody's offering it except the group in Boston at this time. Um, Okay, we'll do one more tracing. All right, so um, patient presents uh, with chest pain and um, you do a, a ZO monitor and um, this is recorded on the patient's monitor but was not symptomatic during the time that this occurred. This was an incidental observation made on an otherwise healthy 14-year-old uh, girl. And uh, this is the finding. So um, David, you are the card, David Barris, you're the cardiologist uh, seeing this patient and uh, you're expecting, as is usually the case, David and I are doing a study with Mahmoud on uh, the uselessness of uh, CO patches for things like chest pain, but uh, you get this back and uh, you're disappointed to see this. So what would you, uh, what is this and what would you think it would be the next step in evaluating or assessing this? Yeah, so this looks like uh, VT. Yeah. Um, so in terms of next steps, I'd want to know, um, how long it's been going on for. Um, I'd want to know if it is affiliated with exercise. Okay, I'd want so, to know. Mm -hmm. So so first of all, let's just take a step back. So I agree, there's nothing wrong with calling this VT. So there are different rules people have in terms of nomenclature, like if it's over a certain rate or if it's a certain percentage faster than the surrounding sinus rhythm, whether they call it VT. So you could call this either slow VT or you could call this uh, idioventricular rhythm. It's hard to hard to know exactly. Everybody has the and, and so people who who like these rules are very adamant about their rules. So, but uh, let's just say for the sake of discussion, David, this was the only observed uh, slow VT on this tracing, and the patient 
did have multiple episodes of chest pain, which uh, all corresponded to sinus rhythm, and the patient um, got their heart rate up to about 175 while playing some sport, and there was sinus rhythm throughout. I'd want to make sure that the um, function was good. Um, right. right. So you would do an echocardiogram, right, to be sure that the patient doesn't have some unrecognized um, arrhythmia condition or uh, cardiomyopathy that could be associated with this. And so the echo is completely negative. <clears throat> so I guess if it's a, a structural, um, I mean, it's it's weird because I feel like I normally would see this um, kind of tracing in a younger patient, like the accelerated ventricular rhythm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I suppose if it's, if it distinct extinguishes with exercise and it's not particularly fast and the function's okay, I'm wondering if you could watch it. Um, yeah. I think normally that's correct. So if you have somebody who has a structurally normal heart with normal function, no family history of, and that's an important part is getting a good family history, no family history of sudden death or cardiomyopathies or arrhythmia conditions. Of course, we're assuming that the 12 lead electrocardiogram is spot on normal. But if all of those things are negative, patient is negative, has never fainted, had any episodes like that, then normally what we would do is just monitor this. Chances are this is some kind of an outflow ventricular tachycardia. As you know, the RV outflow and LV outflow uh, areas can both be associated with uh, accelerated ventricular rhythm a so-called RV outflow or LV outflow VT. And when it's in the LV side, we call it, sometimes we call it Belhassen's ventricular tachycardia. These are generally um, not life-threatening forms of VT, but they can result in dysfunction or fainting. And I guess in theory could degenerate into worse things. But as a general rule, if someone has a structurally normal heart with a normal EKG, uh, normal function, a completely negative family history, we would probably just watch this and uh, how you watch it would depend on your style, but probably in most cases, we would um, perhaps consider um, a uh, maybe a repeat ZEO in three to six months to confirm that this was an un you know a rare finding. And I probably would continue to monitor this at least at least in the midterm, medium term, just to confirm that this isn't happening more frequently. This probably suggests that there could be some alpha track VT that may become more prominent over time. So I would probably keep an eye on this. Um, some people might consider doing an MRI in a patient like this on the theory that they could potentially have like a RV dysplasia type situation, but I would not generally do that if everything else that we discussed was negative in such a patient. But it is an, it's, it's always hard when you see this to sort of almost ignore it, but that's kind of what we're doing, but, you know, still keeping an eye on this particular patient. So, all right, I think uh, we'll stop there. Any questions about the, the potpourri of questions and things we reviewed this week? All righty, uh, appreciate it. And I uh, hope everybody has, wait, I see there's a question here. Oh, I see Dr. Ms. Malholtra said hello. Nice to see you also. Hope you have a good time. Dr. Condon, I'm sure will take very good care of you. Feel free to come visit us in the cath lab today. We've got four cases. So, all right, everybody, have a great day. Take care. Thank, thank you, Thank Dr. you.